My performance is entitled, Margaret Chase Smith, Truth Had a Witness. I am Enza Loera. In the event anyone did not hear the question put to me by Miss McGrory, ladies and gentlemen of the media, I will repeat it because I think it is a very good one. The Washington columnist is asking what I would consider my greatest accomplishment in the 32 years I served in Congress. And I would have to say, Mary, that my most cherished accomplishment is the stand that I took in June of 1950 when I called my Declaration of Conscience speech against then Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin and the tactics that he used in creating a hysteria that in cancer-like fashion was eating away at the vital organs of American society, slowly destroying them and sapping the country of vitality and strength. Please allow me to explain. When Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin in 1946 denounced what he called American imperialism as the number one enemy of communism, the world was divided immediately into two hostile camps. The result was the Cold War. A conflict fought not with guns, but with economic, political, and diplomatic weapons. Neither side trusted the other, and a climate of suspicion prevailed in what came to be known as the Red Scare. A sense of fear, indeed a panic, swept through much of the country that our way of life was being undermined, poisoned, sabotaged by communists. Now please remember that this was a period in American history when the House of American Activities Committee was persecuting alleged subversives in Hollywood. Czechoslovakia, the last non-communist country in Eastern Europe, fell under communist domination. Chiang Kai-shek, our wartime ally, was forced to flee from mainland China to Formosa. Russia was exploding its first atomic bomb. School children all over the United States were actually being taught to crouch under their desks in the event of an atomic attack. Al Hiss, a respected former State Department official, was convicted of perjury. And anxious Americans believed that a Soviet spy ring existed in the United States. Sadly, it was this chain of events in the Cold War that set the stage for the entrance of the man who ultimately became one of the most dangerous politicians in America, Senator Joseph McCarthy. The soil that was soon to bring McCarthyism was actually loosened on February 9, 1950, when Senator McCarthy made a speech to the Republican Women's Club of Wheeling, West Virginia. During the speech, he held up a list of what he alleged were the names of 205 communists who had been made known to the Secretary of State, but were still employed by the State Department. Like a child playing with matches, suddenly the whole thing flared up, and there was Joe McCarthy right in the middle of it. And I should tell you that I began studying Senator McCarthy very closely after his witness speech and didn't like what I saw in head. What concerned me the most was that he refused to let anyone even fellow Republican senators, myself included, examined the list of communists. He flared so dramatically in his speeches. Once I asked him to see the list, but he replied, What's the matter, Margaret? Don't you trust me? It was then that I began to wonder about the validity, accuracy, credibility, and fairness of Joseph McCarthy's charge. I don't think it is unfair of me to say that by this time, Joe was prepared to go to any extreme to make the headlines. He loved being at the center of attention when he suddenly found himself in the limelight as a result of the reckless accusations he was making. He liked it so much and wanted to stay there so badly that he made more and more accusations with no evidence to back them up. Really, he was seeking headlines, not subversives. But in doing so, he was literally ruining the lives of those whom he labeled as communists. You have to understand that anyone targeted as a communist could face unrelenting harassment from the FBI. The loss of one's livelihood, one's home, one's friends, impoverishment, vilification in the press, physical attacks, and often imprisonment. Many people were even driven to take their own lives. Truly, Senator McCarthy was like a hit and run driver who left behind a trail of victims. Well, let me tell you that I began to lose all patience as Senator McCarthy's accusations increased, and there still wasn't a shred of proof. My impatience quickly escalated to a loathing of McCarthy's tactics, which in my opinion were irresponsible, deceitful, and reprehensible. My rage came to a boil in the late spring of 1950 as I sat at my desk in the Senate chamber and listened to Senator McCarthy smear the reputation of defenseless Americans, and then launched into a tirade with several Democratic senators who tried to stop him. 
It was then that I realized that someone had to speak out against this man who was becoming such a formidable political power. But in my heart, I knew that so many senators were afraid of Joseph McCarthy, that no male member of the Senate was going to take a stand against him. It was clear to me that if I wanted to get an indictment from the Republican side of the aisle, it would have to come from my own lips. That weekend, I wrote the speech I intended to give, fully cognizant of the political risks I would be taking by giving it. I knew all too well what can happen to anyone who busts the most powerful men in his political party. There wasn't any doubt in my mind that giving the speech could result in a political suicide and ruin everything that I spent my whole life working for. But my conscience simply would not permit me to take any other course. It was a matter of principle, not political expediency. I knew that no one has a right to own our souls except God. From the time I was a child growing up in Maine, my parents had taught me to value hard work, independence, and always to speak up for what is right. In the Declaration of Conscious Speech itself, I made it perfectly clear that I spoke as a Republican, I spoke as a woman, I spoke as a United States Senator, I spoke as an American. I stated that I didn't want to see the Republican Party ride to political victory, what I referred to as the four horsemen of calumny, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. I warned the American people that what had come to be known as the silent generation was sick and tired of being afraid to stand up and speak their minds, lest they be labeled communists or fascists by their opponents, of seeing innocent people smeared and guilty people whitewashed. And I reminded my colleagues that the Constitution not only guarantees freedom of speech, but also of trial by jury instead of trial by accusation. I concluded by reading the Declaration of Conscience signed by six other Republican Senators and myself. How did Senator McCarthy react? Well, the next day he attempted to downplay my speech as nothing more than utter nonsense from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> but that was only the beginning of his vengefulness. When the next session of Congress met, McCarthy, the ranking Republican on the Senate Permanent Investigating Committee, ousted me from the committee and replaced me with the junior Republican Senator from California, Richard Nixon. This contemptuous action on his part clearly violated all Senate custom, procedure, and tradition. Next, he began telling people that he was going to break me, politically, mentally, and financially, for daring to differ with him, for criticizing him publicly. And he really tried to, in 1954, by persuading a friend of his from Maine to run against me in the Republican primary. He gave his friend a sweeping endorsement, but denounced me everywhere he could as a friend of communists and fellow travelers. However, I defeated McCarthy's candidate five to one. Please understand that the real significance of my victory can only be appreciated fully when you realize that in the election of 1952, the first major test of the impact of my declaration, Senator McCarthy received 113,000 fewer votes than he had in his initial race for the Senate in 1946, less than any other Republican on the state ticket. Furthermore, the candidates he endorsed were either defeated or trailed the ticket. Truly following my declaration of conscience speech, McCarthy hurt rather than help those candidates with me back. Largely because of my 1952 and 1954 victories, I had proved once and for all that it was no longer political suicide to stand up to McCarthyism. Earlier that year, Senator McCarthy accused the United States Army of coddling commies. The Army retaliated by countercharging the members of McCarthy's staff that acted improperly. On July 30, 1954, Senator Ralph Landers introduced on the Senate floor a resolution of censure based on McCarthy's contempt for the Senate, his contempt for the truth, and his habitual contempt for people. On December 2, 1954, I was among the 67 senators who voted for his censure. Looking back, ladies and gentlemen of the media, on one of the darkest periods of American history, Someone had to open the curtains of truth, had to let the nation know that what Joseph McCarthy was doing was terribly wrong. There is no doubt in my mind that individual freedom in America would have been seriously eroded, perhaps beyond repair. My declaration of conscience speech had not been given when it was, and had the impact that it did. Clearly, in my declaration of conscience, truth had a witness. Thank you.